All right, let's go ahead. Um, Walt, uh, well, Joe, why don't you open with prayer since you're there? Well, stretch us almighty and holy father, we come before you at this time to thank you for this time we have together to worship you and to discover the hidden truths that have been closed for centuries and opened with your book of Revelation. We pray that you will help us to not only understand it, but to digest it and to be able to remember it as we go forward. We pray that you would bless those who are not with us and help them to return to us soon. We ask for their blessing to be upon us always and to give us sharp minds and clear understanding of the visions that John saw and got those in Jesus' name. All right. Well, um, it's been about uh, two and a half months, the best we can remember, since uh, we, we got going uh, back on Revelations. So it's, it's good to be back, and I'm glad Joe was able to fill in all he was able to do there before we got too far into it. Um, so what I'm going to do, uh, we had just gotten started on the... Um, Four Horses of the Apocalypse, and I'm just going to take a few minutes to once again get a running start into that, um, because I know there was some that came on um, who did not, uh, were not here when I explained like the structure of Revelations, um, like Johnny and Hannah, uh, Amanda. Um, I don't know if they're here tonight, because I, I don't have a screen I can see everybody, so... Yeah, we're here. Uh, what I thought I would do is we have our open this slide here that we talked about that we spent uh, uh, probably a couple of months on going through all the components of this opening scene. And we um, re uh, talked about how this is the actually the end of the story. This is not something that happens and then all the history follows after this. This is the culmination of the kingdom in its final glory at the moment that uh, Christ would give it up to his father. We, I'm not going to go through all these uh, parts again because that would take too long. But we know that um, we got to the point where um, the lamb took the scroll uh, from he who was sitting on the throne. And we looked at the two components of the lamb, uh, the lion uh, component said it was worthy, but it was the lamb that took the scroll. And this lamb had seven eyes and seven horns. And we talked about all those components, which I, again, I'm not gonna uh, go back and go through all those again. If you missed it, um, uh, just go back and look at them, they're on YouTube. Um, so he takes the scroll of him that sat on the throne. And now before we move forward again, we, we talked about the telescope uh, analogy of explaining how revelations is structured and uh, just real quickly uh, if you remember uh, if in, in case there's someone there who did not catch it before uh, revelations is structured sort of like a, a, a eyeglass like you see in the picture here and when it's just pulled out it it's kind of hard to understand but what you're going to see is that, as we talked about before, if you collapse it, time is collapsed within itself, and you can pull out and look at the different elements and in their historical time. And, um, and we talked about how at each joint of this, we see things like the white robe multitude, uh, the rainbow angel, uh, temple in heaven, the lamb on Mount Zion, the marriage supper of the lamb and down at the end, the new Jerusalem, the millennial reign and um, uh, peace and joy. And all of these are elements of the kingdom age. So after we go through like the seals, we will see a, as it says at the bottom, an interspersed vision of glory. We will actually be uh, transported into the kingdom age. And that's why when this thing collapsed, if you collapsed this, uh, telescope, just like the one I'm showing here, that white robe multitude, um, the lamb on Mount Zion, and all of those would now move forward to the kingdom age, but we're pulling them out to look at them, and what this has done is that these are different areas in time where we see visions of the kingdom, but then we go back in history 
to see how history continues to unfold. And that's just in a nutshell. We, we spent a lot more time on it before. Hey, Roger. So yes. the last one that has the thunders, we don't know what they are. They're, right. They're an extension of these things. Why do you suppose that's not recorded? Okay. Well, that's what I was getting right in this next slide. Um, the seals will deal with pagan Rome, which is what we were just getting opening up uh, last time I taught. And when we get to the trumpets, after we see a vision of glory of the kingdom, uh, 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 pagan Rome has now turned into Catholic Rome and how those um, judgments are against Catholic Rome. And then when we get to the vials, it'll be Catholic Rome will have become papal Rome. And then at the very end are the thunders, which is uh, John was told to shut them up that um, that was not going to be revealed until the kingdom age. Now, I'm not sure why. Joe was just asking the question, why is that? Um, it really wasn't explained. But what it tells us is, is that there are still things to be revealed in the kingdom age. And why he wouldn't um, reveal that, I, it just doesn't seem to be recorded unless someone knows um, an answer to that, uh, we just, we re it really wasn't talked about, but it's things that will be, uh, revealed at that time. So, uh, I'm sorry that might not answer Joe your question very well, but I, I really don't know the answer to it. The only thing I'm curious, the only reason I ask that is because I'm assuming that Christ will come back at them before the thunders begin. Right. Like, okay, so that won't be another thing we have to read through that we didn't know about until the end. Right. If you see the marriage supper feast right there, well, we know okay. the marriage feast is on the front end of the kingdom after the saints are raised and judged. Then there's going to be, uh, and I think I, I get into this at uh, some point down the road, it might be the seven different um, judgments that come upon the earth after Christ is in the earth okay. to set to finally bring all the nations to their knees. I'm, I'm thinking of about six months in advance here when we get to this is that these are judgments that will take place on the nations after Christ has revealed himself. The ones we're looking at now with pagan Rome, Catholic Rome and papal Rome are judgments that have already taken place in history. So now we're going to go to uh, chapter six and the opening of the seals. And this starts with the judgments on pagan Rome. So um, I can't hear anybody. I would need you to turn off your uh, mic so we can hear Roger because I'm hearing feedback. I I don't know who, what, how to. Uh, you what, can ask Helen and Frank. You can ask Joanna. You can ask Catherine to read or Patsy. All right. Uh, Walter and Melinda. All right. Kathy, would you read this? Revelation 6 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four living creatures saying, Come and see. Okay. So at this point, now we. Um, he's being invited now to interact with the vision. Um, and what's uh, he's about to see the very first thing in history that's about to unfold. And of course, as you can see from my presenter view, um, it's going to be the four horses of the apocalypse. Um, and this is the first thing that is going to shortly come to pass because that's how this is written. And this is what he, he was told about those things that would shortly come to pass. Um, so this is the very first thing that he's given. Um, now, as I mentioned last, uh, uh, well, about three months ago, but for those who were not here, uh, mainstream Christianity feels that this is something that's all going to come in the future. Um, there are actually whole movies made about the four horses of the apocalypse and about uh, how it's going to appear sometime in the future. But actually, the four horses of the apocalypse came 1,700 years ago, and it's completed. 
And that's, and we're gonna look at sort of in a nutshell about what all that is about. Um, let's see, uh, who's, who, uh, Joanne, can you read this? John Thomas and Eureka, the question is a, sim, is a symbolical personage, non-representative of an individual man, but a class of agents blindly executing retribution upon those obnoxious to the lamb's displeasure. Yeah, uh, John Thomas always talked in uh, quite an elaborate uh, way, but what he's, we uh, know is that the horse represents military might. And of course, Rome was the most powerful force on earth at this time. So he's using this um, to sh actually show the, the starting of the, the decline of the Roman empire from this point. And blindly executing, as you can see in my notes, is um, God is using them uh, to fulfill his purpose um, of what happens here. Uh, just like when Moses told Pharaoh that God had raised him up for this purpose, but Pharaoh never knew it. So they, Pharaoh never realized that God was using him. He thought he was totally in control. And that's what's going to be happening as these horses unfold. And of course, we always hear about the four horses of the apocalypse, but John saw them in successive order. Um, each one would represent the first four periods of time that were going to unfold. And we got into the first horse uh last time so i don't know how much you remember but we'll, we i would hate to start halfway through them especially for those who were not here before and for those who were not here at the opening of the class which i think johnny and amanda uh, were not here uh the way i'm covering this class is like a stone skipping across the lake there's a lot of deep things you could spend weeks on the four horses of the apocalypse but I'm just hitting the highlights just enough to show uh, how it fits with scripture. And we've got a lot of history to cover and this thing will still take uh, the better part of a year to cover. So um, Leah, would you read this please? Revelation 6-2. And I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Okay. So we have a white horse, um, which suggests a time of righteousness going forth to conquer. And last time we looked at this, we looked at the pattern of things. If we, uh, in the scriptures, if we jump all the way to Revelations 19, 11, we get this. Leah, would you go ahead and read that too? And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he... Christ that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Okay, uh, continuing on. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in white linen, white and clean. All right, so we can see from this that white horses represent righteousness, and it represents the righteous riding upon them. And this is in the same book. So we can only assume that the um, the horse that he sees here is has to do with the truth going forward and being spread. Um, and the, as I got written here, the arrowless bow is a time of conquering without bloodshed, but through the word. And in Psalm sixty four three, we see how arrows arrows are used to represent speech. If you ever want to look that up. So uh, a lot of people don't realize there's no, no arrows with this bow. He just has a bow. Um, that's because the word of, of God is um, what they're using for their warfare. All right, Joe, would you read these next, this next slide? And let me bring the whole slide up first so you can read right through it. All right. Okay. I work on the For though we walk in the flesh, we are not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not the flesh, are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy households, sorry, strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Okay. So that we can see our, our, our warfare is different and it's, it's based on the word of God. 
And that's what was going on in this first time period right after John's death, um, that the truth was spreading mightily, even though, as Joe pointed out, over the next few hundred years, the persecutions were going on uh, in different parts of the country uh, of the empire at different times. And we will actually get to one of those possibly tonight um, that we're going to look at to uh, back up some of the things that Joe was talking about. So what we had here in the first seal, Rome experienced about 80 years of peace without war after John's day. So Rome was going through a, a peaceful time. They weren't being attacked. They were like the big man on campus and no one, they had their little skirmishes with barbarians and all on their borders. If you read the history, there was always some kind of fighting going on, but there was no one trying to overthrow them. Uh, and during this time, the, the truth spread throughout the Roman world. Um, in 80 years, the gospel spread pretty much throughout the whole Roman uh, empire in some capacity. And it was becoming a very big thing. All right, who's, who's uh, tell me somebody, I can't see Helen, the screen. You can ask Helen Kaiser. Helen Kaiser, would you read this screen for us? Okay, uh, Pliny, a magistrate of ancient Rome who lived during this time and wrote of this problem to the emperor Trajan. The number of culprits, i.e. Christians, is so great as to call for serious consultation. The contagion of the superstition has spread not only through cities, but even villages in the country. All right, the, yeah, he says it's a contagion, something that's contagious uh, of this superstition as he saw it. But this man actually lived in that day and actually these words got recorded in history. And I think this is one of the great gifts that God has given to the saints. The world might not think anything of it, but it's, it's backing up this, this time period of this first horse. Um, and uh, like as you can see in my notes there, the people stopped worshiping the gods and joining the army. You know, they were turning Christian, so they were falling, not joining the army. The infrastructure was being affected. Uh, like money, not going to the upkeep of the temples. People were giving their, their money to the truth. Uh, and others were avoiding military service. And so what Pliny is pretty much saying is here, how are we going to possibly stop this fire that is spreading through the nation? Um, all right, who's next that we have there? Who else? David and Nancy Boston. You can use um, David and Nancy Boston. Uh, David, would you read this screen? The crown was a Stephanus, which was the crown of victory, like the ones won in the Greek games. Even though it was a time of peace, it was not for Christianity. All right. Yeah, this is a Stephanus. This is not like wearing a crown like you see uh, Queen Elizabeth wear sitting on the throne or something like that. This is the, the wreathal crown um, that he's wearing. So we see that there's a victory that is being won with the warfare of, the, of preaching the truth. Um, so as a horse was a, a symbol of military might, Christianity was spreading mightily throughout the Roman Empire. And what we see in a little over 200 years, it would replace paganism as the national religion of Rome. And that would just sort of have been inconceivable uh, at John's time, uh, hardly. Uh, to the, the regular public, just like if you go back to Mark Twain's time, uh, it was inconceivable that Israel would be gathered back individuals from all over the world and turn that place into a, uh, a living, uh, breathing country, because Mark Twain wrote about how desolate and all, and he was so disappointed at how, what had happened, but it would, it, in his time, it would have been hard to imagine in just a hundred years or so that it would be a thriving nation. So, um, and as I, I have written here, uh, paganism did not fall off the map, but now Christians were in the pilot seat. They had the upper hand as the, over this next 200 year period. And history has recorded this through the letters of men like Pliny. And we will find others that through history, the same also. I think God is showing us, uh, that we're looking in the right place. 
And what we're going to even see tonight, hopefully, is even the coins they minted will show us the prophecies coming to pass and our additional guideposts uh, to us. All right. So, okay, hang on. Whoop, I went a little fast. Okay. So that's the white horse. So let's, uh, it's showing us that the truth was spreading, but now another, uh, the truth would continue to spread. Uh, be aware that these horses periods overlap. It's not like a cutoff point and then the next one, but this is another type of judgment that is going to come upon him. So who did you say? Joanna. Joanna. Joanna? Are the Castillos there? What? The Castillos. Uh, I don't think so. There and there know. went out another horse that was red. The power was given to him that sat therein to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. All right. So I, I, I put in uh, yellow here the, the key points to think about. First of all, he's red. Um, but he's, it's going to be peace is going to be taken from the earth and they're going to kill one another. So we can see an infrastructure problem here in the Roman Empire. So the horse is red with a great sword. Uh, now, what we're going to see, you see this guy, mostly the, this red horse guy gets painted with this huge sword in his hand. But it was not a great sword in the length of it, but in the power of it. And that's what we're going to look at. And red suggests bloodshed. And this word sword is translated machara. And it means knife or dagger. Now, um, same thing as French. <laughs> so it's not again. It we know that a dagger is a powerful weapon uh, that can be actually hidden under your clothing and things of that nature. And it is, as we know, it is um, it is the most commonly used weapon in assassinations. Now, this is a part of Roman history. We're all getting in we're getting into here that most of us are familiar with about caesars getting assassinated and things like that when i show you the statistics it it's amazing how much of this was going on it, what it amazes me is that i looked at it one night by myself the praetorian guard yeah, we'll look supposed at supposed to protect the caesars like yes. the secret service protects the president we're the ones who killed off most of the Caesars. Yeah, we're going to cover that. That's in here. I'm just telling you. I know. It's cool. just, it's amazing. It's really cool. Uh, and how many people, how many Caesars and emperors were assassinated is astounding. It was, we always hear about Julius Caesar or somebody like that. One major high profile assassination. Uh, remember Ehud and Judges, how he snuck in and killed Eglon. Um, with a dagger, he, he he held he had it hidden up under his thigh, and you could get into um, places where you could kill someone quickly and escape quickly. And here's what, as Joe was just bringing up, the Praetorian Guard. Uh, who are these guys? And you can see they're pretty. Uh, if this is a realistic picture, um, you can imagine if you had a whole army of these guys who decided to take matters into their own hand. It would be hard to stop them. Um, it was a force of bodyguards, as Joe said, used by the Roman emperors. It started off as a good thing to protect. Um, and at one time, command of Praetorians was the rank of Purgoin, if I'm saying that right. And, Pugion. huh? Pugion? Pugion. Pugion. And it means dagger bearer. It is exactly what it means. So we know that these guys, and I don't know if it represents that sword he's got in his hand. That's still a pretty good sized sword. But it may be a sword or a, a dagger that all of them carried on them. And out of fear, we're, we're in history, if you read about it, and we're going to look at a little bit of it uh, tonight, uh, out of fear, they were given high pay and liberties because they feared them and they got paid very well. And then when someone would come along who wanted to get the books a little more uh, in place. Okay, Joe, Joe has one. <laughs> I don't know why a brother in Christ is carrying it. There's the one that Joe has. Um, put that in front of 
y'all can see that. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll we'll talk to Joe after class about what he has in his house and where he got it. So well, anyway, as you can see, it's a, a a pretty nasty weapon that could be concealed very easily. I think we're all very familiar with them. Um, so um, what's happening at this time, peace for Rome was gone and, and this became an era of assassinations. And that fits with, they take peace from the earth that they should kill one another. So this period of time is, um, it fits very well with the, the imagery of this horse and this thing about taking each other's life. And here's what here's what'll be real interesting where we'll start to look at these people. It started under the reign of one man. Um, and that is this fellow right here. And some of us might be familiar with this guy. This is Marcus Aurelius Commodus. And he lived, now see where we are in time now. We're at 180 to 192 AD. Um, and what happened with this guy, he had assassination temp against him and it made him very paranoid. Um, I've got it in my notes somewhere here. His father's, he co ruled with his father for a while until he died. And his father was the last emperor that had a relatively peaceful reign um, and control, but things started getting a little scarier after that because, and it started with this fella. Now, if any of you have what, ever watched um, The Gladiator, this is uh, this guy, Jacqueline Phoenix played, uh, Joaquin Phoenix played uh, Commodus. And if you remember the movie, he was absolutely paranoid. He played it very well. It wasn't a total accurate, thing, but you can see that he's wearing the Stephanos here, the Stephanos or however you put it. But anyway, here's a, here's a real picture, uh, uh, bust like of the it. guy. Um, and he was known, he was actually a very powerful man. He, um, he fought in the gladiator ring against wild animals. Um, and so he was well known for being a gladiator type. Um, but the thing was he, once they tried to kill him, he then attempted to do away with a lot of the Senate himself. Um, it would became him against the Senate and anyone else. Um, so this is the beginning point in history to the Red Horse period, as the brothers have written about uh, who have gone before me. Uh, now, who's next that can read? There are Let's choose uh, busy or Queenston, and if not, Amanda or John. How about Amanda? Why don't you read this? Sorry, if the kids are acting super crazy. Johnny will read it. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Hi. Um, so from the very beginning, right? Um, whereas the reign of Marcus Aurelius, his father, had been marked by almost continuous warfare, that of Commodus was comparatively peaceful in the military sense, but was marked by political strife and the increasingly arbitrary and unpredictable behavior of the emperor himself. Keep reading. Um, in the view of Cassius Dio, a contemporary observer of the period, his accession marked the descent, quote, from a kingdom of gold to one of iron and rust, a famous comment which has led some historians, notably Edward Gibbon, to take Commodus's reign as the, quote, beginning of the decline of the Roman Empire. Okay, and it's very interesting that uh, Edward Gibbons, um, if anybody's ever looked at his work, he wrote a five volumes on the, the whole decline of the Roman Empire uh, back in the um, uh, mid 1800s. And it's interesting that he used the phrase iron and rust what was the Roman Empire in the image? It was the legs of iron. Right. That's uh, not rust proof. <laughs> rust is rust holy. Yeah. So it's interesting <laughs> that this writer, just trying to write the history, wrote about it being iron and rust. 
And I think, again, these are the things that I learned as I was learning this, how God has lined up men who wrote about things and said things that didn't even realize that they were talking about the prophecies that would take place, like the, the, the fall of this image and, and, and things of that nature. Um, all right, let's, let's go on to his loss. Uh, who's next? It hasn't read. Eb, are you there? How about Betty? Betty or Eb? I'll read. On December 31st, 192 AD, an attempted poisoning of Commodus mm -hmm. and he was strangled to death in his bath the same night. From this point on, we see the great sword carried out its purpose and it carried on for the next century. All right, so what happens here is we get into, uh, this is like the first real assassination that takes place of this period. And as we go through these next uh, couple of horses, it, it accelerates um, the, um, the whole, um, I, I'm trying to think of the word, stability of the government is just declining, which adds to the slow decline of Rome. Um, so let's, now this is uh, one of the horses that I struggled with finding something really good on it that really was striking. And then just this past month or so, I was able to find something that just totally blew me away about this period of, uh, of Christ showing the saints that you're looking in the right place uh, but the world is totally unaware of it. Um, so who, who hasn't read yet? Uh, Nora or um, oh. Karen Brom. All right, uh, Nora, can you read? Yeah, but it's blank right now. Okay, Revelation 6, 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the th third beast say, come and see. And behold, an Io, a black horse, and, and had that sat on him, had a pair of balancing in his hand. Yeah, a pair of balances in his hand. Okay, now when you think about a horse mm -hmm. coming charging, and the guy's got a pair of balances in his hand, he's not too intimidating, is he? <laughs> no. Uh, so it... There's something here, though, that is very powerful that, remember, these things are um, signs and symbols of the times. We're not to be frightened by them because, first of all, they've already come to pass and, and all. But uh, the point is, it's telling us where to look in history. Um, uh, this horse represents a lot of harm to the infrastructure of Rome. And again... Uh, Rome was not overthrown by another nation where Babylon, Persia, and the Greeks were all overthrown by the previous country. Rome decayed from within. Um, and here we have, again, uh, I, I meant to mention it before, but the, here we have the third beast speaking. So there's more interaction that John is having, this beast or this living creature in this opening scene that I showed you at the first, um, and that we've talked about, that it appears that John never leaves this opening scene, uh, and that all of these components of these uh, creatures interact with him and show him things, but yet he never seems to leave this place. Yes, um, the scales throughout history have always been a symbol of justice being this dispensed. Mm -hmm. um, they still use it in courthouses today. When they do the modern art and architecture program. They put something in relation to scales and balances because it's the equaling out mm -hmm. of wrong to right. right. Um, so, I mean, that symbol hasn't gone away all through time. So, I think... I think it's in some of our, some of our symbol, symbology, in American symbology, isn't it? Liberty, and, and there's somebody holding the scales. But it, it always it goes back to English law, the English law, back to Roman law, or Roman law, back to Jewish law. Mm -hmm. It's all banked on the thing of Moses, because he said he hates unjust scales. Unjust scales, yeah. So that, that whole concept of justice rides 
in, in the scales because you have to have proper judgment. So this third seal seems to have I mean, carrying judgment to the earth. Equal justice. Oh, actually, well, what was that? Somebody said something. I said equal justice. Had to be yeah, equal. equal justice. Well, I'm going to uh, suggest something a little different here from something that I found. And uh, I think you'll find it striking that it's actually possibly telling us where to look in time, not so much about the justice of God, but about something that was going on in history. Remember, these are all historical symbols about something in history taking place. So, um, well, this, let's move forward and I'll show you what uh, you're going to see here. It will be interesting. Uh, Karen, would you read next, please? Karen isn't here, so I'll read. Well, we can go back up to the top if that's okay. And Walter or Linda, can you read? Can you hear us well? All right, we'll give it a try. Okay. Third seal. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Okay. So as we can see, this is going to be dealing with um, an, the economy. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the, the whole economy is going to be stressed at this time. Uh, uh, the assassinations are still taking place. Um, the red horse is still riding along. Uh, he didn't just stop. But we're going to see that through this. So let's, uh, um, it's a little different when I don't have my notes where I usually like them. All right, so here we have a black horse with balances. Let's just look at the components. So we get a sense that prices of food are high. Uh, and that's what it said about it, that things would be very expensive. Um, the blackness of the horse suggests a distress of the land. And again, this isn't so much about bloodshed as it is about the distress on the people and how hard it is to get food and things of that nature. And that's historically telling us that we're looking in the right place. All right, so um, the scarcity and high prices were a result of heavy taxation on the part of the government, um, a result of the reckless lifestyles of the emperors that followed is what we're going to be looking at. So we've got to look at these next emperors that are in place. And as we are, we're going to see that the, the sword, the red horse uh, with the sword is still working. All right, and it's, it starts at this guy right here, because this is right after uh, Commodus's time. And this guy is called Caracalla uh, from 198 to 217 AD. And uh, and we will find that these emperors cared more for themselves than they did the empire. And Caracalla never, this is interesting little piece of history, Caracalla never lived in Rome or went to Rome. And he was very brutal, yet he was emperor of Rome, Rome as a nation. Uh, he didn't ever live in the city of Rome where a lot of, you know, the guys did. Um, now here's a coin of him. Um, and here we go, he Kolru, he co-ruled co with his brother Geta till he had him assassinated. So here they actually kill their own family members for power. This shows it's not just killing another uh, 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 public enemy or, or anything like that. He killed his own brother for the power. This says something about his character. Um, well, and when you have the Praetorian Guard and the wealth of Rome at your disposal, the flesh can run rampant, is what we're going to see in this. Um, and we have seen this in our lifetime with men like Saddam Hussein um, of Iraq, Gaddafi of Libya, and they cared nothing for their own people, and they would gas them if it was convenient. Whatever got them out of the way, um, man hasn't changed. And Caracalla was no be uh, different than... The, the men we've seen in our lifetime. Um, so moving forward with a little more history on the guy, uh, here's uh, what he did. He lavished many benefits on the army. And this is where the Praetorian Guard uh, was doing very well because Caracalla was taking care of them. And you imagine these guys who were willing to kill anybody uh, 
if you suddenly took that away. And that's what we're going to see happen. Gibbon, who we just talked about, who wrote about the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, in his work describes Caracalla as the common enemy of mankind. That's how bad he was. It was he was just really, really bad. And this picture here is about the only thing standing that he had built. Um, but it was a bathhouse, a lavish bathhouse that could hold about 1,500 people or so, if I remember the details right. But he, he taxed his own people, not, not Christianity. Right now, we're not even talking about Christianity. We're talking about um, what they did to their own people. Remember, they kill one another. And he would tax them greatly. And it put such a financial strain on the people to pay for these type of things. Uh, and of course, as we know about economy and inflation and all that stuff, it gets really bad. Uh, if money's not managed well. Um, so along with taxes to cover his li this lifestyle, there was a great stress on the land and cruelty. And he was known for the massacres of those Romans who offended him. He, he you know, he didn't, this is again, they kill one another with the sword. And this is looking right at history. This red horse is, is going right along with the black horse at the same time. Um, it, it, uh, they, again, they definitely overlap, but there's different layers of these judgments that are getting laid upon Rome to break it down. And after 19 years as an emperor, he was assassinated while, and this is what Hitch recorded, relieving himself on the roadside. One of his men ran up to him and ran him through. Um, it took him at a weak, weak moment. As a, you know, this is what history records. They just they kill you and we'll get somebody else if we don't like you. Because I think he killed, the man who killed him, Caracalla had had someone in his family killed. So it's just a lot of vengeance taking place. But this is what's, uh, and here's where it gets worse in another direction. This was the guy that took his place. Um, this guy's name is El Elgabalas, huh? Elgabalas? I could never say it. <laughs> I go good. But anyway, try to say it three times real fast next week. You're gonna have to practice. Elgabalas. Elgabalas. Well, anyway, you can see he has a very short light, 28, 218 to 222, and he was only 15 years old when he was made emperor, 15. But what, all right, so what, what was it about this guy? All right, this is a, a painting of him um, uh, that was done. Now, I don't know when it was done, but you can see how uh, the guy there on the couch in the back looks just like that uh, bust of him. And what he was different was he indulged himself in extreme sexual and religious perversion. And this is that painting is like you can see a sort of a free for all taking place. This is what he was known for. Now you're talking about a 15 year old. And if you read the real history on him uh, in Edward, Edward Gibbons book, which I, I read through his uh, somewhat, here's what he said. Um, who's next? Uh, Joe, why don't you read this? This. Biggie developed a reputation among his contemporaries for extreme eccentricity, decadence, and zealotry. This tradition has persisted, and with writers of early modern era, he suffered one of the worst reputations among Roman emperors. Edward Gibbons wrote that Legabalus abandoned himself to the grossest pleasures and ungoverned fury. And if you read the details about all this sexual uh stuff it was off the charts it's kind of like where things are getting in this nation now it was really really so bad he was right up there with uh nero because he was well probably so but um and so i just sort of wrote this in what we have here is a sexually confused teenager governing the civilized world and that's a a, a disaster waiting to happen uh, of course, and it was, we didn't last long. And it's very interesting here, the red sword is still running rampant. 
He was 18 years old when he and his mother were assassinated, conceived by his grandmother, and carried out by the Praetorian Guard. So <laughs> it's it's pretty bad times. So we so see the grandmother hired the Praetorian <laughs> Guard to put her daughter and grandchild to death. Yeah. Yeah, her name was Athelaya. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. It's a repeat of history. Oh. Um, Amazing. So for these few years, these two men stress the land with their lavish lifestyle. But we have one line in this verse that we need to cover. And this is what became striking to me. And I could never quite find the answer in the first few years I taught this class where it said, but what, but what about where it says, hurt not the oil or the wine? Um, well, his cousin, Elagabaeus' cousin, Severus Alexander, took his place. As you can see, he's a young guy too. But this guy was in the other direction. He was very studious. He was very smart. He was very good with numbers. Um, Leah, why don't you read this? Okay. Yeah, I know. I got to get through this. One. Alexander did much to improve the morals and condition of the people and to enhance the, the dignity of the state. And he favored Christianity very much. Excessive luxury and extravagance at the imperial court were diminished. Okay, now li listen to this. Keep reading. History records that when he appointed balance holders of, provin of providences, let their names be made public so that they could be held accountable to the public. He is quoted as saying that they should not act unjustly by the oil and the wine. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> that, that just blew me away. Uh, see, now they, that's just history that's recorded and put in the history books and the books are shut. But for you and I, it's it's a revelation. It's a, of Jesus Christ. It's amazing. This quote, it comes from Eureka on uh, John Thomas's time. Um, and if it's accurate, what a guidepost we have here. Um, and I know we're running out of time, but you need to see this. This is very, very important. This is the coin of Alexander Severus. That's the front stuff. Look at the back side. Do you see anything? Those small scales. Scales. Again, another hello there. <laughs> they did not know that they were carrying the prophecy about themselves in their very pockets. God would not leave us blind to any of this. He has shown us where to look and that where we history has gone and we can... The, the brothers and sisters of the ages could see these things and have some idea of where they are in this. Um, I'll go ahead and, and close. Uh, um, oh, actually, I get one more person. Who else we got? That can, Linda hasn't read yet. Is she there? Linda Lord. Yep. Yeah. She's here. Go ahead, Linda. His downfall came when he tried to bribe the invading Germanic tribes rather than fight them. And his legionnaires found this dishonorable and assassinated him. Of course, I keep reading. The crisis of the third century, also known as military anarchy or the imperial crisis, AD 235 to 284, was a period in which the Roman Empire nearly collapsed under the combined pressures of invasion, civil war, plague, and economic depression. Keep reading. <laughs> the crisis began with the assassination of Emperor Severus Alexander at the hands of his own troops, initiating a 50 year period in which 20 to 25 claimants to the title of emperor mostly prominent Roman army generals, assumed imperial power over all or part of the empire. That's a, a lot of emperors in 50 years, 20 to 25. Okay, um, keep in mind that the brethren of the day were suffering also, whatever economic problems were going on, just like we would if our country was collapsing internally. Uh, they're going through it too. They are suffering. And they're also dealing with... Uh, um, persecution in different areas of the nation. Well, that'll bring that leaves us with the fourth seal for next week, and we will look at this guy. Um, he's pretty depressing. 
Uh, and there's a whole lot here in this also. So we'll stop there. Uh, I hope that was, um, we had some hiccups there to get started, but I would, I'm glad that uh, we were able to get through it as best we could. I hope that was interesting to people. I found it fascinating myself. Yes. Any questions or statements? Complaints? <laughs> Thanks for class, Roger. What's that, Dave? I can hardly hear. Thanks oh. for class. <laughs> oh, okay. You're welcome. Well, with that, uh, I'll say good night and we'll see you next week. I'm going to be one more week and then we're out of town uh, one week and Joe's going to finish up what he was doing uh, uh, with his uh, ten persecutions. the 10 persecutions. Yes. So. A very All good right. class. Thank you, Roger. Thank you for being you. there and, and plowing through the our technical difficulties. <laughs> good night, all. Good night.